Welcome everyone to this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. I'm Tim Grady and I am here with Lou Weiss, who is the president of All Metals and Forge Group and also the founder of Manufacturing Talk Radio. If you're looking for open die forgings and seamless roll rings to make, for instance, those big gears behind it, check out steelforge.com. Joining us today is Chris Wallace, who is founder and president of Interview. And that's going to be an interesting conversation about marketing. Uh, Chris, I read with great interest, and it just burned into my mind. The comment you made, the moment of truth, are your frontline people telling the customer the right story. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I like that line. Thanks for picking that one up. That's a powerful line, and it's for the business owner. It's a terrifying one. <laughs> we um, we always ask that any brands that we work with, we ask them how confident they are that the people representing them are telling their story the right way. Are they telling it consistently? Are they telling it effectively? And you want to see people squirm in their seat, ask them that question, because you know they know they got it right. But, but the people who, who work with them and the, the people who represent them doesn't even have to be an employee. It could be a channel partner. It could be a distributor, whoever it is. They need everybody on message. So um, we, we definitely have some uncomfortable conversations around it. <laughs> how do you get them on message? Oh, man. How, 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 long's, how long's the episode of the show? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm going to say, what's that? What's that, Lou? That's my line. How long of a show do we have? Um, well, so I'm going I'm to start by saying, um, you know, on message, I'm going to tell you what not to do first. Okay. Sometimes it's easier to start with what not to do. Um, I get asked the question all the time, where, where do organiz why do organizations struggle with this so much? And the, you know, the answer I always give is um, they look at it as um, that they're not doing enough to, to get people on message, they're not providing enough information, they're not doing enough training, they're not doing, you know, providing enough catalogs or, or one sheets or whatever the case, maybe we're sending enough emails. I think we can all agree we get enough emails, but um, it's not that they don't do enough, it's that they're not doing the right things. They think that they can just push more information out and they can, they can just push volumes of facts at their people, and that's going to turn people into storytellers. Um, and it's just simply not true. That's not how people process information. The line I used the other day was I was actually talking to Lou. I said, you know, you don't get, you know, I don't get my son to eat his vegetables by showing him a, a you know, the nutritional label, right? Just sharing facts isn't going to be how you get somebody to do what you want. Um, we believe that the way that you can get people aligned and get them on message is start by listening, right? Rather than pushing information, it's gathering it and, and hearing your people and understand what their perspective is. And that's the best starting point to get them aligned and get them on message. So explain to our listeners and viewers, interview, which is I-N-N-E-R-V-I-E-W. Yeah, so in our interview, we do exactly that. You know, our job is to... In, you know, we always say we do internal marketing or we're doing, you know, channel engagement or channel marketing. And that's why we love working in the manufacturing space so much is, you know, in manufacturing, it's not just your employees or just your salespeople that you need on message. You've got, like I said, distributors. A lot of the people we work with have manufacturers rep firms. Many of them have uh, dealers or contractors that, that ultimately are the ones serving the customer. So there's a lot of different audiences that you need to get engaged and I think too often what happens is, um, you know, brands look at it as we have to keep the, co the consumer engaged. Well, the people who talk to the consumer have a major influence over, you know, what that consumer decides to buy, how much they end up spending. So we look at it as the, the human messengers here are important. So that's what we help organizations do. We help them understand these audiences, these people who represent them, and then help them reach them and engage them in new ways and innovative ways. Um, I'm happy to share some examples, but in a nutshell, that's it. You and I, when we spoke a couple of days ago, we talked about something that Tim and I have discovered over the last couple of years. We've been in manufacturing a long time uh, from the sales side, particularly with my metals company, All Metals and Forge Group. 
one of the things that we found out over these past number of years that we're doing manufacturing talk radio is that manufacturers, they, they know how to make things. They know how to conceptualize things. They know how to produce them. They know how to ship them, except for now when we have supply chain issues. But one of the things that manufacturers don't have, and I think most manufacturers would even agree to it, is that they don't know how to market. The world has changed. The marketing has changed. So can you, can you address that? Uh, have you experienced that, that they too understand that they don't know how to market properly, appropriately, and so on? So, um, so I think that there's a fundamental disconnect that, that um, might lead you to believe that they don't understand marketing. And I think that disconnect is, and I'm, I'm going to say something that might be unpopular with, with manufacturers, um, but the reality is, unless you're Apple, the products that you make aren't different enough for the product alone to drive the, the, the buying decision. Okay. Ultimately, I'm talking about people choosing to buy and how they're going to choose one thing over the other. Most manufactured goods are not by, by nature of the product features or the, the, the specifications better enough than the competition for people to say, I must have that because it's that much better. The only company I've ever seen that has that is Apple. They're the only company that I know that people say, I will buy whatever they make because what they make is just flat out better, okay? Everybody else has to compete, okay? So we look at it as if you accept, right? If you accept that your product in and of itself, the intrinsic value of your product or the features of your product aren't better than the competition, then you can find the reasons the opportunity, it's an opportunity to find the things that can make you different and can make you better. And I'm going to give you an example. I had a call this afternoon with a roofing manufacturer. I won't say which one, but a roofing manufacturer. And the roofing manufacturer is recognizing that they make really good products. They believe they make really good products, but they don't believe that's enough to stand out. So what are they doing? They're looking for ways to reinvent the experience that they deliver for consumers and making the consumer's life easier and the process of buying and getting a, a, a roof installed at their home a lot easier, expanding their choices, bringing green energy uh, opportunities into the mix, and really looking to deliver a more advanced, more modern experience for the consumers. And they want to be known as the experience company, not the roofing company, not the shingle company. They want to be known as the experience company. So they're looking at it saying, we're going to compete on something other than product. And they've chosen experience as that path. We are big believers that Effective marketing is truly helping people understand the difference between you and your competition, why you might be better, and you have to compete on something other than product specs. I'm not, really? sure, I'm not sure that that really answers or, answers or responds to the point that I was making. So I, I don't mean to uh, no? disrupt your mental flow there, but... Um, Many companies, especially the smaller manufacturing companies, they don't have a marketing department. Uh, so they'll go and, you know, the owner of the company will get his granddaughter to come and do whatever. Yeah. Yep. You know, that sort of stuff. And that's, that's really not appropriate. And it doesn't approach what you're talking about to differentiate between my product and the next 10 products. Yep. So, so one must go out and then find someone who is the expert who can guide you to do better, uh, present your product better, present a, a better sales experience uh, and so on. But what we find is that manufacturers don't really all have it put together. I, I think, I think, um, I think in some ways we're saying the same thing. I think it's the, if we make it, people will come you know, if you build it, they will come sort of mentality. And right. I think that I, I will answer, I, I will answer your question, address your question by saying that simply uh, putting a picture in the product specs onto a page or onto a website does not constitute marketing, right? And, and I'll go back to that idea that the product alone, um, most products have to be romanced a little bit, you have, you have to, you have to tell a story around it. So I, what I would say is, I don't know if it's that they're not good at marketing. I think it's the lack of recognition 
that you do have to tell a little bit of a story around it and you do have to find ways to differentiate. And people just use um, time-honored marketing methodologies. I mentioned a few, emails, brochures, product catalogs, things like that, that really don't help the product stand out. So I think a lot of times when you say marketers, they're not good at marketing. I think it's lack of expertise. And I think it's taking the path of least resistance. What, what did I do? What did people do 25 years ago? Let's just keep doing that. They really need to find ways to push the boundaries to truly compete around marketing. Uh, I'll accept that response. Finally. Anyway. <laughs> that, wor that works. That works. It, okay. it, it's kind of a cross between I don't know what to do or don't know how to do. I think it's the what we've always done. I think that's the what we've always done mentality. So, well, this is, you know, we have product, put it on spec sheet and, and send it out to the people who, who sell for us. And we can do better, right? We, 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 I, think that, I think that marketers can, can elevate their game. And the point of, I think your bigger point is probably just lack of investment, right? It's, you know, w w you, you kind of get what you pay for. If you're not willing to invest on the marketing side, you're not going to get fresh thinking. And yes, there are plenty of companies that, that have a family member running their website or, you know, or running their social media and they think that that's marketing. But um, I think overall, my point is there's, there's a lot of different audiences you need to reach, right? It's not just the end buyer. You know, it, it depends on what type of manufacturing you do, but there's usually a number of different people involved in that process. You've got to market to all of them. So what is it that you do for the manufacturer, whether he knows what to do or not do? How do you, how do you grab them and pull them into uh, your, your world? Well, I, so again, I'm going to answer the question with, I'm going to start with what we don't do. Um, and we don't do consumer marketing. So we are not a branding company. We are not a messaging company. That's, that's not our, we don't build advertisements. We don't do ad buys. That's not our world. What we do is we work with the people who do those things. Okay. We work with the, 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 the teams and the departments that build those messages. And then we ask them, who are all the people who interact with your customers? Now, typically the response that we get is, What's your definition of customer? Because in the manufacturing world, there's multiple definitions of customer, right? There may be a business to business transaction that ultimately leads to a consumer. But what we say is, who are all the people who could stand in front of a potential buyer, whether they're a business buyer or a consumer and represent your product? Who are the people who carry a bag or wear a shirt or, or, or stand in front of a display representing your product? So we try to help them understand who all those audiences are. In a lot of cases, it's more people than they, they thought, right? We, we help them uncover, yeah, I didn't think of those people or no, I guess, I guess they really are. You know, they are representatives of our product. And we, we, we help them to find who those channels are, right? Who are all the audiences they need to reach? Then we have a tool that we call the brand transfer study. And the brand transfer study goes back to Tim's first question, which was, you know, how do you get people on message? Well, we start by listening. Once we know who the people are that we need to have on message, we do, it's, it's an assessment. It's, it's, an, it's an, an alignment tool where we're able to come back to a manufacturer and say, here are all the people that represent your brand. Here are all the people you need to be on message. Here's the message that channel is telling. Here's the message that that channel is telling. Here's the message that that channel is telling. And you can imagine if you've got three different channels, they're all telling a little bit different version of the story. And in some cases, a widely different story. So we go back to the organization and we say, you would be typically the marketing department. And we say, here's what you said it is. Here's what they think it is. So now we've got to build tools and support to help either change their perceptions or take the feedback that they've given you and have you adjust what you're doing from a marketing perspective. So it can work both ways, but really what it comes down to is understand who the audience is, understand what the audience thinks and find better ways to reach them. We're basically running an internal marketing campaign. Um, it's just a little bit different way than people usually think of this. So let me go really far back, even though they still exist today. And that's the, um, the outside road guy who runs around the countryside carrying his little schlep bag at a shake case for those who don't know what schlep is. And he's running around and he's got his brochures and he's got his product sheets and so on and so forth. 
which is really, a, I think, a dying breed. Would you not agree? There's a lot of those people out there. Absolutely. A lot. We work with a lot of them, for sure. But are they telling the story that's going to generate new, new business? Or are they telling the same old story over and over again? It's a great question. So uh, this, this, here's my answer to it. What I would say is this. Most companies... Now, I know, you know your audience might be you know, manufacturing across a wide scope of different types of products, but in the companies that we work, a lot of the companies we work with, they grow by introducing new products, right? That's how they grow. They introduce new products. They expand their product offering. They get into different segments that they weren't in before. I talked to a, um, a plumbing manufacturer early today, earlier today, and they said, we're about to launch um, a new product in a new segment. And we said, is it a new segment for you? And they said, it's a new segment for anybody. Nothing like this exists, okay? How do they grow? They innovate. They try to come up with new products to meet, you know, to meet consumer needs. So they're about to introduce this new product. They're like a lot of other companies. They grow by introducing new products. That's how they generate more revenue. But what happens is when you have people who are out schlepping with their attache case out on the street with their brochures, um, depending on how long they've been doing it, they may have their old standbys. Ah, I sell this stuff. This is the majority of the products that I sell. And when you're introducing new products and your growth engine is the new, new product and the new innovation, overcoming that salesperson's perceptions and getting them to embrace and getting them to sell it is probably the biggest obstacle to growth that you have. It's not the consumer. Or it's, not, it's, not, it's not the ultimate buyer. The buyer told you they wanted it. You invented the product or you, did, you created the new product and did the product development because you heard from customers that they wanted it. If the person who sells it decides they don't want to talk about it and they don't want to sell it, your product can be dead in the water. So my answer is they, a lot of cases, there's inertia and they go back to selling the same things that they're comfortable with. Companies have to get them comfortable selling new stuff quickly. And most organizations struggle with that. Especially in today's market. You know, we have so many negative obstacles to selling product, to building product, to making product, and so on. So to get them, to get the old guy to buy into the concept of a new product, which he may not even understand. I mean, you know, when you mentioned before about a plumbing company, you know, I, well, I know nothing about plumbing other than that stuff goes through pipes, and then you have an on and off switch. Other than that, I know nothing about it. I could never sell plumbing. Yeah. I can't even imagine what a new product is in plumbing. You can't make a new pipe. The pipe is the pipe. So how, how do you get new people? Forget about the old guy. What about the, you know, the, the, the manufacturing company in plumbing? He, he, he's short three salespeople. What is he going to do? Where is he going to get new salespeople? And then tell them the new story about the product. So, so I'm going I'm to answer a question with a question like any good salesperson would, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm a salesperson too. Um, I think that you know, when you, if, if you launch a new product and the person responsible for selling it, if you have, you have two options, okay? You can tell them what to do or you can ask them what they think. If they think it's junk or they're skeptical, wouldn't you rather know that wouldn't you rather know that they're skeptical of this new category or this new product? If you, if you build an environment where people feel comfortable sharing their skepticism, it's, it's just like anything else in, in, in life and any kind of relationship, right? If you, want to, if you want to convince somebody of something, you're better off to understand their perspective. It, it, you know, for your listeners, you know, I may be talking about some things that aren't typical to your day-to-day, -day, but I can boil it down by saying, um, by listening to them, you know, the, the core of any good selling is listening, right? And if you, if you want your salespeople to sell it, sell it to them first. And it's that simple. Don't, don't expect that a product spec sheet or an online training or a catalog is going to be enough for them to say, woohoo, I want to go sell this new product or I want to represent this brand or I'm willing to try to tell this new story. You've got to get them energized too. So don't take for granted that just because you make it, they will sell it. Because everybody who's listening to this knows that's not true. Everybody knows that, that whether it's a rep firm or an in-house rep or somebody out on the street 
whatever, whatever, whatever role they hold, when they talk to a customer, they can decide what to pitch and what not to pitch. And you have very little control over that other than to make them want to do it. Our whole approach is get them to want to do it. Don't tell them they have to. Chris, I, I'm going to ask you this because what you're proposing makes eminent sense. How do you present interview to a prospective customer? What, what, what's the, the elevator pitch? Well, the, the, elevator, the elevator pitch is that we can help you align your marketing and your sales. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we look at you know, most organizations, they struggle with it goes back to that question I mentioned at, at the beginning, Tim, which is that idea of how confident are you that people are telling the right story? Um, our elevator pitch starts with a question, right? How confident are you that they're telling that story? And if you're not, say we're we're a we're a con we're a consultancy, and that's what we are. We don't we don't hide from that. We're a consultancy. We're, our niche is that we help brands align their marketing strategy with the people who are out there selling it on the front lines. And in the most in most cases, it's it's usually on the consumer side. So a lot of the manufacturers we work with are consumer products. Now they do have business to business relationships, but they're consumer goods. But our elevator pitch is we can help, we can help make sure that the people who sell for you sound more like your advertisements and the strategy that's behind your advertisements than, than what they sound like today. It's that alignment piece. Great, excellent. So if someone listening to this wants to get a hold of you or find InnerWorks, where do they go? So, so, uh, so find, if you want to find me, um, best way to find me is on uh, LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn, um, sharing content and, and trying to start dialogues there. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so it's Chris Wallace. I'm in Philadelphia. Um, the Philadelphia part is important because there's a lot of Chris Wallaces. Um, so don't try to connect with the guy from Fox News because um, he's not me. Um, so Chris Wallace in Philadelphia and the company is Interview Group. And like Tim said earlier, it's I-N-N-E-R-V-I-E-W, Interview Group. And you can reach us at interviewgroup.com. Um, we also, if you're interested in learning more about the brand transfer study, brandtransferstudy.com. The, the, the listening piece and, and gathering those frontline insights is such a great starting point. It's a great investment. And um, it helps you really understand the audiences you're trying to reach. Well, I like you better than the Chris Wallace on Fox News. So I'm glad that you joined <laughs> Boy, am I glad I wasn't the one who said it. I'm the one always accused of bringing up negative aspects about politics. So I've, and Tim never does. This is a first. Well, I'm, I'm glad I was here for, for new ground to be broken on the show. Yes, you were. And, uh, we appreciate you being on the show with us, Chris. I think it's great information. I think it's a great approach. I think there's a real void there that your company can fill. Lou and I experience it all the time. We see it all the time. So I think you're in the right place, right? Time. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks for the time, gentlemen. And thank you for being on the show. And if anything comes up new and advanced, let us know. We'd be happy to have you back on. Well, I'd love to. Great. And we'll, we'll have a conversation offline, uh, Chris, because I think there are some other pieces of the puzzle we can work on together. That sounds great. I look forward to that. Be well. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. I would like you to go to I-N-N-E-R-V-I-E-W group, interviewgroup.com to find Chris's company and information. And while you're surfing the web, stop over at jacketmediaco.com, where you will find the links to all of our podcasts, including this show. And thank you for listening to this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. 